Our guest in this segment is uh, Ken Tiger. Ken, good morning. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? It's great to have you on the show. I've, I've watched you on the big screen and the little screen for much of my life, I think. Oh, well, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> you should be having other things filling your life than just watching me, but thank you very much. No, I, I committed to it 20, uh, 30 years ago, Ken. I, I got to get me some Ken Tiger 24-7 on my TV and on my movie screen, too. Oh, my Lord, Tiger.com. Tiger you found me. <laughs> T-I-G-A-R, uh, by the way. Not to be confused with the Tiger King. Totally different no. phenom. <laughs> Completely different. Completely yeah. different. Although when I was growing up, Tony the Tiger was, you know, the, the constant jibe at me, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, that's right. But uh, I don't know whether, I don't even know whether that one's around anymore. But yeah. Uh, at any rate. Thurl yeah, Ravenscroft. Great voice. That guy had a great voice. Yeah. Hey, uh, tell me about your uh, career before we get into what you're doing here in Shepherdstown, which is always uh, very cool to get into. But uh, tell me about your career as an actor and how you got into the trade, so to speak. Oh, my Lord, how did I get into it? Well, I didn't really anticipate going into it. I mean, I think that, that kids who go into it and who know immediately, you know, from, from the time that they're born, I want to be an actor. Uh, that didn't happen to me. I wanted to be an actor, but it was always a hobby. But I thought, oh, nobody can do that. Only famous people can do that. Um, so I, I was actually training to be a teacher. Um, uh, my, my field was, believe it or not, German literature. And, um, and I got all the way to uh, the end, and I thought, you know, I don't really want to do that for the rest of my life. And um, uh, it's a long story, but one thing led to another. I, I was in Vienna, actually, with, uh, with my wife at the time, and uh, she had a Fulbright there, and I was kicking around, didn't know what to do. And I got asked to join a Viennese acting company, uh, and I spent my year there acting in German in Vienna. And I thought, somebody's trying to tell me something here. So we came back to the United States, and, and I went into the theater, and, and I've been working ever since, stage, film, TV, and uh, it's been a fabulous, fabulous time. And you studied at Harvard, if I remember that correctly. I did. I was there for 10 long years. I got an undergraduate degree, and then I got a Ph.D. I mean, I thought that I was going to teach German literature. I should call you Dr. Tiger then, shouldn't I? Oh, please don't. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I guess it distinguishes me from Mr. Tiger, who is my father. I'm, as, as the saying goes, I'm just Ken. Just Ken. Tell me about yeah. the, the Lethal Weapon set. Uh, you, you made Lethal Weapon 2 and Lethal Weapon 3. Tell me about that, because that, uh, that was a serious cast there. Oh, it was wonderful. Um, uh, Richard Donner uh, had uh, come upon me and, and asked me to do... Uh, Lethal Weapon 2, and, and, and Donner, who, who did the first Omen movie, for example, who did that first um, uh, Superman movie with Chris Reeve, um, he, he was an extraordinary man. Um, he was just one of the most vibrant people I have ever known in Hollywood, uh, a great human being and a great director. And uh, he put together the, uh, the the Lethal Weapon movies. The first one, which I think is really spectacular, which I'm not in, um, is really one of the very first movies that has um, a, a a white and an African American buddy system, where the the white guy is looking up to the African American as a role model, which is really very interesting. I mean, it it, it completely turns the tables on the kinds of relationships that we used to see in movies, and 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 Donner was very interested in that. He was very uh, important in the anti-apartheid movement, which was going on at that time. And so the Lethal Weapon movies really built on that kind of a, a relationship, and it was a new relationship. And he cast two spectacular actors, uh, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson, to play the roles, and they worked really well together. And I, I loved being on that set. Um, the, the, the guys were terrific. Um, it, it was great fun. And working with Donner was one of the most creative experiences I've ever had. 
I got a text from a friend of mine who said, you stole the Avengers movie, totally stole it. <laughs> and then he said, you got to ask him, because he's a radio guy too, you got to ask him about WKRP in Cincinnati. <laughs> Well, I, I just showed up briefly on K, uh, WKRP. That that was fun. I mean, the, the, those people were out of their minds. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, it's always fun to be around comedians, you know. Oh yeah, as God is my uh, witness, I thought turkeys could fly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, but the Avengers, the Avengers was was really quite spectacular. We. We shot it in in Cleveland, and that wide open set they had, they had uh, cordoned off a, a big area of Cleveland to to do that, and we we shot it over the course of a few days. And um, you know, I it's just one small scene in this big movie, and and uh, uh, I was actually doing a play in Rochester at the time and and the the movie people and the theater people were very good with each other and um they they worked the schedule so that I was able to drive from Rochester to Cleveland uh, for a couple of days in order to do the to do the movie and then hurry back to uh, Rochester to do I I was doing on Golden Pond there at at Jiva at that point and so uh, um when when I went and I did the movie um you know it's just you know, a few minutes in the movie, and I thought, well, you know, you, you never know whether it's actually going to appear in the final cut of the movie. Um, that's that's always a danger. You're going to be the face on the cutting room floor. And uh, just before the movie came out, I started getting emails from friends congratulating me. And I said, what do you mean? They said, the, the, the review in Time magazine. And I said, what are you talking about? It turns out that that the the scene was you know it turned out to be the big scene of the movie and uh, and but who knew you know you 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 go in you do the work you you work as hard as you can and try to make things as good as you you possibly can and then sometimes magic happens the way it did with the Avengers I'm, it's something I'm actually very proud of. As well, you should be. Ken Tiger is our guest here, and he is uh, going to be appearing in the month of July in Shepherdstown in the Contemporary American Theater Festivals. Uh, of course, they put on many plays during the course of this festival, but he'll be particularly starring in The Happiest Man on Earth. Mr. Gilstrap. Uh, good morning. Uh, what I know of acting, I've learned from inside the actor's studio and those, you know, the stacks That's of blue cards from, from James Lipton. And uh -huh. there are, I've learned there are kind of at least two schools of acting. Those who... I guess they call it the method who just study the character and get, you know, all, all of this research. And then I was watching Beverly Hills Cop just the on a, on a trip overseas. And the the version I downloaded was actually the director's cut. And I'd seen the movie, uh -huh. you know, a thousand times. So you really uh -huh. couldn't even hear the dialogue. But what you heard was was this narration. And I heard that the, I don't know if you remember the movie in detail or not, but the... It, no, I mean, I saw it a long time ago. Well, the Beverly Hills police chief was played by Stephen Elliott, who's this, this, uh -huh. this grizzled... Great actor. Right. And this Italian, excuse me, Irish grouchy guy, who apparently was handed the script 10 minutes before they shot his scene. And he's got, wow. the, he's got this rolled up, piece of paper in his hand and he comes in and he yells at everybody and that is his script in his hand wow and wow. he steals the scene and then he walks off and that's his day he's you know wow. he's, that's his time in the movie where do you fall in your in your acting style well you know it, it depends because sometimes it, you, you sometimes you can control um how you can approach a script and sometimes you can't sometimes it all happen has to happen very quickly and um uh, you know, you talk about um, actor studio and working all of those things out. The the that kind of method uh, is geared to priming your instincts and your emotions so that you have ready access to them. Um, if somehow you're asked to act, you know, on the spot, or as in it, when. Um, Steve was given that script or sometimes happens, you know, you, on, on a uh, on a sitcom, for example, you're constantly rewriting, constantly rewriting. And sometimes 
you just get the script and and have to to run with it because uh, they've rewritten it just before the audience has walked in. And at times like that, or when you're doing when you're doing um, improv, um, you. you you just have to tap into those emotions, which are right at the surface anyway, because you're you're in such a high stakes situation. Um, you don't have time to think. All you have time to do is 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 talk and and feel, and whatever comes out comes out. Um, uh, some of that is training, so that you you, you say to yourself, "All right, um, I'm 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 not Ken Tiger right now. Uh, right now, I'm 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 playing." Um, you know, uh, Jacob the Worm in this, you know, in this improv about, you know, uh, life underground. And then you just say, okay, well, uh, all right, so there, there, are the, there are the tree roots around me, and I think I'll take a little nibble. And, you, you know, you just start, you start going with what you've got. Um, and that, that is training. Uh, there are people who can't do that, but, you know, the, the, the real good ones um, and the people that have trained, this is what we do with our lives. We, we train to, to be able to create what we're given, and we don't necessarily have the luxury of, uh, uh, of creating the script itself. Now, segueing from that to The Happiest Man on Earth, um, I was very lucky that you know, this was – I did the, the, the world premiere of it last summer up at uh, Barrington Stage in, in uh, uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and we did have weeks and weeks to work with the script, and, and the script evolved. Be, uh, it was, we had to cut it. it there, was, there were a lot of incidences that we, in the, the man's life that we had to cut down, and, and we had a chance to work on the script, and, and because of that, um, it, it really seeps into the bones. And uh, the, the, the way I perform that is very different from, um, you know, flying by the seat of my pants. This is something that's, that's deeply ingrained in me. And, and it's also a script that I, I deeply love. I mean, this is a, 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 an incredible story and that we're telling in, in the play. And it's something that everybody should hear. Uh, uh, about about courage and determination, and also about um, hate and love and and uh, redemption, um, and uh, it's it's a magnificent story, and it's something that I, I, again I feel incredibly proud to have been able to be part of, really from the very beginning. Ken Tiger, our guest, you can see him in the month of July at the Contemporary American Theater Festival. Happiest. Man on Earth. Is this a, a particularly large cast, Ken? It's a one-man show. One-man show. That's what I thought when I was first introduced to it. Uh, we talked to um, Peggy McCowan, I guess, about two weeks ago in regards uh -huh. to this particular play. Is it intense? It's pretty intense, yeah, but it's also really very – it's it's fun. I mean, it, it, it's based on a, on a memoir called The Happiest Man on Earth. Um, by a, a man, Eddie Jacob, who was a Holocaust survivor. And at the age of, uh, he, uh, you know, he, he was 13 years old when, when uh, Hitler came to power. And by the time um, he was 25, the war, he'd, got, he'd gone through Auschwitz and Buchenwald and the Death March. I mean, it, 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 just unbelievable horrors um, that he'd gone through. And yet he did it with with such determination and and at the end of his life at the age of 100 he wrote a memoir about it and called it the happiest man on earth and talks about not only what happened to him but how he overcame it and how he grew out of it and how he faced all of these these uh terrible things um it, it, there's a there's there's a wisdom to it and there's a love to it that that sort of softens the horror. So it's important for people to know what actually happened, um, because there's a lot of talk that it didn't happen. But it, you know, this is a memoir, somebody who lived through it, and uh, and also it talks about why things like that happened, and how do we stop that hate from happening? How do we? Uh, uh, how can we be good neighbors to each other rather than? enemies to each other and uh how can we make the world a, a better place and he goes from uh you know the, the the beginning where he's he's in a concentration camp to the end where he's he is the happiest man on earth 
and uh, it, it's a it's a it's a really a lovely piece. I mean, uh, I come on really as a as a as a happy guy and tell a story, which is pretty hard to listen to at times, um, but it, it's one of redemption and survival. How many times will you be performing it in July? Do you know the count on that? I don't remember the exact amount, but you know, I'm doing it uh, from. Uh, we, we open officially. There are a couple of previews before that, but we open officially on July 5th, and then we're playing it. I think it's eight times a week uh, until July 28th. So, if, if you're a marathon runner ar around, you know, maybe the uh, seventh or eighth mile, you kind of hit your stride and you, you're kind of gliding uh, in a very comfortable path. It, does it work that way when you're performing a play? So many times you know, over a month. Really, it, 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 that, that's amazing that you use that that metaphor because I always use the metaphor of running a marathon when I talk about doing a one person play. Uh, I've done a couple of them before, and it's exactly like running a marathon. Um, the rehearsals are really important because um, it, it, it's hard to. I mean, th this play is almost an hour and a half long. It's an hour third. 20, 25 minutes, and it's just me, just talking. And uh, it, it takes a certain amount of energy uh, to do that sort of thing. And and you really have to, it, it's like uh, doing uh, calisthenics or push-ups or, or running. You know, the, the more you do, the, the, the more you are able to do. And, and it takes a bit of energy. And um, But I've done the play now um, before, and so the rehearsals have been easier this time. And uh, we're in tech rehearsals now. We're putting in the lights and this, in the sound. And, and we're going to be able to face an audience very soon. And uh, it, it's very energizing, you know, uh, at the end. <laughs> when, when the curtain comes down, I'm a little tired, but I'm really very, very excited because we've gone on a wonderful journey and it's exhilarating. Uh, I'm, you see marathon runners, and most of them are smiling rather than crying when it's all <laughs> over. So from night to night, do you edit as as you go? I, I, I presume no. that you'll have either a laugh line or an emotional line one way or the other will resonate more profoundly one night than another night, or less profoundly, perhaps? Well, yeah, but I wouldn't call that editing. I mean, editing is, you know, changing the script, and I, I, don't, I certainly would never dream of doing that. But one of the things about live theater, as opposed to film and TV, is that live theater is different every time you see it, um, because uh, you're in a different place, your energy is a little bit different, you're getting something different from the audience, um, uh, things just play out differently every night um and and one emotional moment it, it won't be exactly the same um and that's what makes live theater so exciting uh that it it it's in the moment it's it's immediate um what, once you've done it for film and tv you'll do it many many different times in different takes but once they edit it together that's it that's the one everybody remembers um so, uh, yes, every performance is different, and every performance uh, has a life of its own. And, and to a certain extent, that's because the audience is part of any play. It's particularly true in this play because I'm talking directly to the audience um, uh, about uh, a certain, certain circumstances in my life. Um, but really, in, uh, in reality, any live performance – the audience is involved because the aura, if you will, that comes off of the audience, that feeling, the the group dynamic. Uh, anytime you sit in in a crowd, I mean, whether it's in a theater or at a concert or a church or at a PTA meeting, you can feel that there's a feeling that comes out of the out of the group, and that's always uh, right there when when for an actor, you feel it and you work with it. And so the audience is part of a play always, always. Ken, we've got about 30 seconds left to answer John's last question here. I just wondered, does it take you a while to become Ken Tiger again at the end of a show? We've been doing this long enough that when the, when the show's done, the character's no, put away. N no, it, it, I mean, it's exhausting, and I, I take some downtime. You know, I just have to take a, you know, a few breaths, but... 
you know, I don't go into Never Never Land. Yeah. Uh, no, that that doesn't happen. I'm back to reality. It, um, part of that is rehearsals and having done it. But I love doing it, and then I love seeing how the audience reacts to it, and I do that as Ken Tiger. Ken, great to have you on the program today. I know you'll do great in Shepherdstown. I hope you enjoy the area. and uh, I love it. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for talking to me. Take care. Take care. I have my tickets. Oh. Great. See you then. Enjoy your day, sir. Ken Tiger. And uh, just a, a couple of notes about that. The Contemporary American Theater Festival begins its run July 5. And Ken Tiger, just one of the members of the productions that will be taking place in Shepherdstown over the month of July, uh, including plays What Will Happen to All That Beauty, Enough to Let the Light In, Tornado Tastes Like Aluminum Sting, and, of course, The Happiest Man on Earth. CATF.org is how you find out more about that. Back with a final minute next. <laughs>